Hello, everyone. Welcome to 440 Gallery Artist Talk. Today, we'll be talking about Side Streets, James Acevedo's solo show, and also Resonance, a group show in the project space with Joy Mackin, Robin Roy, and David Stock. Both shows are up through February 18th. Uh, as always, I encourage you to go to the gallery to see the work in person. It makes a huge difference. And at the same time, thank you for coming today. If you can't make it to the gallery, I'm happy you can see the work virtually. Um, so we're going to take a look at uh, the installation shots. And while we're looking, um, if any questions come to mind, I'm going to ask you all to hold your questions until after I ask the artists the questions. You could put in the chat or you can jot it down or remember, and then we'll open it up to the group asking questions. So um, if you stay muted until then, that's helpful because um, it keeps the ambient noise down. Uh, so here's James's show in situ. So you can kind of see the scale and the relationships that are happening with the work as it hangs in the gallery. And I always enjoy seeing photos of the reception because, uh, or with humans next to the work, because then you get an idea of the scale and mm -hmm. can be very important. I'm going to be talking about that large piece. So I just want you to notice the size and, um, and how it looks in relation to the other pieces. Now I'll take a look at uh, the images individually. And as we're looking, I'll start to speak to James. James, congratulations on a fabulous show. We've been enjoying the vibrant color, the refreshing compositions, and your own special treatment of subject and materials. This is exciting because it's your first solo show at 440 Gallery. Could you please tell us how Side Streets came into being? Uh, thank you, Karen, and um, and thank everyone for for tuning in today. And um, and Karen, as you mentioned, yes, this is my my first solo show here at 440, and um, I'm very excited. Um, I really want to thank the the members um, for all their support and guidance. Um, I've it's just been about two years, and um, it, it it's a lot of work. It take it takes a while to um, to put together a show, but um, I'm very I'm happy with how it's turned out. Um, all the members, um, my my wife Ann Finkelstein and my daughter, um, and and the community. I've I've I feel like I've entered into a new community, and it's um, 
it's quite a pleasure. Um, I, I feel I have found a, a good home for my work. Um, and well, concerning side streets, um, you know, my work is I use the city as my as my subject. Um, and I, I think of side streets as really as a way of kind of orient orienting um, how I feel about what I'm doing. Um, I, I make this distinction between um, that in New York, um, there are the avenues and the avenues are are what get, get all the attention. They're they're the they're big and they're they're glittering Park Avenue, Fifth Avenue. Um, well, I'm I'm not an avenue person. I'm a side street person. That's where I get my inspiration. I go off off the avenue. Um, I look for un the unexpected, the um, the the overlooked, the things that just kind of um, appear to me. Um, from what I see and what they trigger in my mind. Um, and that's the source of, um, of my work. It's, it's also a kind of search. Um, and I can't always say what I'm actually searching for, but um, my artwork reflects this. Um, so it's part of my process and, and the side, it's the side streets. I've, I've had other shows um, called side streets. There was one in the nineties. I had big, um, big prints of, of city scenes um, that were digital. So it, it, it takes different forms. Um, so I, I think my hope is that um, after seeing my work, um, that the viewer then goes out and, and they see the city kind of like anew. Um, Absolutely. Um, so let's focus on one piece, the piece 14th Street and 7th Avenue, Red Corner. Uh, it's so fascinating. So much is fascinating about this piece. Compositionally, it seems to have been pared down to just what is needed to tell the story, yet it's far from sparse. I'm intrigued by the materials you use and the technique to achieve this. Can you illuminate us more about this piece? Uh, yes, yeah. Um, I especially like how you you see it as a story because um, that's very important to me. And I don't necessarily think of it as a narrative or as a literary story, but um, there's something happening. There's an encounter, and um, and I work towards that in uh, in works like this. Um, my my method is to, on the street, I am taking photographs. Um, I always have a camera with me. Um, or if I'm seeing something, um, I'll, I'll go home in the evening and I'll, I'll, I'll make sketches or I'll make notes. Um, and then from, from, from those, um, the photos and the notes, I begin piecing together things. Um, and I have a, a very large collection of, of, um, of images that I, I literally extract from to create um to create works um and i will be you know i'll be inspired by a scene but a work like this is is literally pieced together you know like this is not say there was one moment um that say i photographed and it was exactly this um there are many moments um but it is a scene that I, I began to think um, I wanted to construct, um, and this idea of construction, I think, I think is 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 um, very important to me because I'm not only am I my method of putting together things almost collage like I'm also doing that in the actual painting. Um, these are paintings on uh, a paper called Yupo, which is actually a synthetic paper. It's a um, plastic base um, that I use because it's um, it's very flat. It also rolls, so it's easily stored, um, and and it can come in a large size, so it's a, a little easier to to deal with than um, say a stretcher or a panel. And then the the painting, um, it's a it's acrylic painting, 
um, paintings go through many layers and, um, you know, I paint and then I overpaint. Um, I, I draw onto them with um, um, oil pastel or a, a, a watercolor crayon. Um, and, and slowly the paintings are put together. Um, so that's my process. Um, and, and do you want to talk about the um, vertical, I mean, horizontal lines a little bit? Because um, uh -huh. that really um, gives another whole aspect to this piece. Yes. Um, well, to me, that's, an, that's part of the aspect that I call construction. Um, mm -hmm. I know I was thinking about this, um, or some, I was speaking with, with um, someone else, and, and I spoke about how when I was a printmaker, I, I made prints by by drawing or, or painting or um, you use an ink in lithography and I, I would be making lines. Um, however, later I thought, you know, I remember that um, when I was in um, undergrad, I, I made um, works by piecing together wood and I would glue together slats of wood um, and then later I made small constructions where I pieced, I glued together wood um, that they look like fences or, or the sides of houses. Um, and I thought, oh, you know, those are lines. <laughs> um, so it's something that I've used for quite a while and it's kind of internalized. Um, I also think of them, you know, they're, they're broad strokes. Um, it's an, it's a, uh, a graphic element of introducing a color on another color and breaking up um, uh, a solid, um, but it's just a way that I have, um, eternalized as, as making an image, um, that often appears. Um. Yeah, thank you. Um, I love it because it, it makes the, uh, painting its own thing rather mm -hmm. than just becoming like a scene like a, on a familiar corner. It, mm -hmm. it then becomes its own thing that you have to kind of navigate the painting as well as the scene. I don't I mean, that's how I see it. It's really beautiful. Um, so now I'd like to focus on palette. Your colors are luminous and harmonious and also seemed even pushed. I think of the Fauves, what inspires your use of color? Um, well, I do think of color as a very personal um, choice. And I'm, I'm not always able to answer exactly, well, why, why did I use that color and not another color? Or how did I, I go about to, um, um, to, to get to a specific color? Um, I do like that. Um, when when colors are layered and then also broken up that they can produce colors that are unexpected so so that that that's an aspect um of of the lines um i i i am um i do look and have been inspired by by the fauves especially their approach to color where color is not um the the separation of color of natural color, like um, that they would say, well, the sky doesn't have to be blue or a person's face doesn't have to be the flesh color. It can be um, an entirely different color. Um, so I like that. Um, but as to, um, I, I often rely on just as I'm working being, you know, something will pop into your head and, and you'll say, oh, I need this here. Um, I need this color. This this field needs this or that, um, and I like that. Um, to me, that's part of the excitement of painting, that um, that you do discover some, you discover things, um, and and also it's not entirely you're not able to control it, um, and I, I to me that's part of the attraction of painting. Um, it's a fine line between um, failing and succeeding, and um, and that's to me that's exciting. Um, um, 
Well, I would argue that you've controlled your color really beautifully. Um, mm -hmm. This piece, for example, and especially if you see it in the gallery that um, it, I was trying to understand what's so special about it to me. And I realized that something about it embodies those shimmering colors that, that you know, would have been too fussy to like try to put them in the um, feathers of the birds in the painting, but somehow the whole painting has that aspect to it of that, uh, those like shimmery rainbowish colors that show up in when you get close to um, pigeons feathers. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know how you did it. That's magical. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I'm not sure how I did it either. <laughs> and, and also, if you saw, you know, th there was a point in, say, a work like this where it was like, okay, I have to throw this away. This does not work. Um, and it, but, you know, you work through that. And yes, it totally works now. Um, so, uh, James, you've spoken about your theme of side streets literally and figuratively. Where does this show lead you? Uh, what can we look forward to coming up in your work? Mm -hmm. Well, in this show, um, you know, the large piece is actually the last piece that I did um, before the virus. And it, it um, was the end of a cycle of paintings that I'd been doing of, of street scenes and corners uh, specifically. Um, and I'd been maybe six or seven years and and um, well, really not affected by the virus. I, I I really wanted to change what I was painting um, and to paint some other things, and that was really the genesis of what um, this show is about. Um, however, um, in November and December, I I thought I needed two more paintings, and the paint for the little window spaces in the front. And I did those two figures, like, like this is one, the uh, figure with the blue hat. Um, and then there's also the figure with the purple t-shirt um, that I really liked. I had a lot of fun doing these. And um, I, I want to do um, some figure paintings now. And I'm not quite sure how I'll do them, um, but it's percolating in the mind that I'm going to do these paintings. Um, maybe there'll be groups of figures, but maybe there'll be single figures. Um, I'm very excited about that. I think people in the city um, are very important um, as, you know, as, as we can be inspired by the buildings and the things in the city. You know, cities really, it's the people. Um, um, I think the people are almost timeless um, there. Um, and I, I would like to do some some paintings that kind of um, honor and respect that, that when when people look at them, they'll be, they'll feel good about people. Um, so th so that, that's, that, that's the task that I've set myself to do. That sounds exciting. And um, yeah, I noticed that this feels like, um, zeroing in on one of the figures that are traipsing around the side streets mm -hmm. and now we kind of get to know a different story of an individual. So uh, I'm excited to see more. Thank you, James. So we're going to move on to resonance in the project space and we'll start with speaking with Joy. So let's take a look at Joy Mackin's watercolors, just two pieces in the, this show. Joy, congrats on another really lovely show in the project space. Your two pieces here do not disappoint. They're astounding watercolors. What led to your selection and for this grouping? Thanks for the great questions, Karen. Um, when David, Robin, and I were planning the show, we showed each other our work. You know, we, we talked about some things. Um, and I, I was really taken by the exquisite detail that the three of us bring to our work. So in, in that way, it made, it made it very comfortable for me to, you know, go through my recent paintings and find some things. 
Um, I was really taken how we all as a group, we tell a story through that detail, which is color and texture, and also just a devotion to, you know, the techniques that we use. Um, and with that, I chose these two paintings from, they're recent paintings, from one's from Bryant Park, this one, and um, the other one is from Prospect Park. And that kind of made it easy to, to select these for that. Um, they, they have for me, you know, the, the detail and light and dark and composition and also the storytelling, um, people and animals in it that, that made it, you know, good for the show, I felt. The resonance that we talk about. Absolutely. Um, in both pieces, Joy, I'm charmed by the point of view you portrayed. Can you speak about your compositional considerations? Mm -hmm. um, I just actually heard James talk about a simple, similar thing. Um, my camera is always with me, either in my phone or, or another camera that I carry with me. And it's a sketchbook and I walk around and the composition starts developing when I see something. It, it, I put it in right away into the picture that I take that I then bring back into the studio. So um, in the studio, I'm, I, you know, most of the photographs that I take, and I do take a lot of them, they don't get used, they stay in a, you know, in a folder on my computer and I, and I don't use them. But the, the few that make it through usually have something going on with an interesting story. Um, it might have an interesting, um, a challenging watercolor technique for me that often scares me, but it's like, let's give it a shot. Um, or there's something going on that just catches my eye. And in, in this case, this painting from Brian Park, um, I wouldn't have painted it unless the bird was there. The fact that the bird flew in while I was taking the picture, really, that, that sealed the deal for me. That's what made the painting work. And, and I love that the bird against the, the skyscrapers as a contrast tells a story and brings a real human emotional element for me into the painting. And it's just also um, a sweet element to bring in that I, I love to put in my work also. Absolutely, it's very charming. Uh, so Joy, your work appears so fresh and immediate. In my imagination, your eye is following the seasons. And I don't know if this is true or not, but it, if it is or not, what's next for you? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm always out there looking for stuff and definitely when, you know, I love the change of seasons in the, in the city, um, you know, when it snows, I'm out there trying to get something, um, when it's a gorgeous spring day, that's the best also. Um, so I'm always, I'm always looking. I'm currently working on, um, a snow scene from Prospect Park, not from this year, from, from a couple years ago. Um, and it's a very, um, a very tonal, um, limited palette kind of scene with very little color in it. It could almost be a drawing, but I'm, I'm, I'm kind of excited about it. And one of the reasons is sometimes I just get tired of painting all that green. You know, I've had enough of the parks. I, I, I wanna change it. I wanna paint something that has a lot of red in it or, or, or so, something. And, and I also do like to always throw myself um, a technical challenge in the watercolor. And I'm never sure what that is. You know, it could be anything. And, and a lot of times it scares me, but you know, it's just a sheet of paper. So um, it's just something to attempt to do and, and have fun with, you know, and see what comes out of it. Well, thank you. I look forward to seeing what you do next. So let's now move on to Robin Roy. And she has two pieces in the show as well. Robin, congratulations on your inclusion in Resonance. Beautiful show. Your two. Yep. Your two contributions are different techniques, but seem like sister pieces. How did your selections come to be here? Um, very serendipitously. They were done at very different times uh, for different reasons. Uh, completely, yeah, completely different times. And um, when it was time to pick the pieces for the show, the colors seemed to go together. And uh, though I didn't think of, of this piece as being uh, like a book. In truth, it, it is kind of like a book in that it has pages that you can flip through. And um, so they're very, they both 
reference. I love the fact that other Joy and um, James also use the word story because for me, the most beautiful phrase in the English language is once upon a time. It's so magical to me. Once upon a time, you know, and then you're you're off into another world. So um, I guess both of these reference a story. Nice, thank you. Um, your accordion book is stunning and an intriguing compositional challenge. Tell us about your bookmaking practice. Um, I've been working on these moleskin books for a number of years. And the first one I did was literally doodling. Every page was a different doodle. And they didn't, each page was separate and didn't really connect. And this, when I started the second one, I realized how much I wanted them to flow into each other and connect with each other. And so they all have, from then on, they, they all have flowed from page to page, but also the, the each one is extremely different. And they don't even always relate to the larger work that I do. Um, but this one in particular involves collage, which, uh, which is very much like my other work or my larger work. Uh, and what other materials have we used here? Um, they, uh, water, watercolor and colored inks and pen and ink. And then um, the moleskin paper itself is not particularly um, uh, lovely to work on, especially with watercolor. So on this one, I, I have a collection of all kinds of papers and the right the background the band sort of in the in the center of of the pages is a band of rice paper that is from a grocery store receipt book it's a japanese grocery store receipt book but it's on lovely uh rice paper and uh, there's all this wonderful writing on it in Japanese, which of course I have no idea what it says. And I don't even know if it's upside down or backwards or inside out or what. I just, it's purely a visual experience and I, I like the way it looks. So, um, and that rice paper takes the watercolor and the inks beautifully. Well, it's really lovely. Um, and, uh, it's fascinating how this um, painting collage becomes this sculptural thing and your piece instinct is very sculptural as well. Um, and I also think that instinct is a fascinating mix of nostalgia and collage technique. Can you tell us more about your instinct for this piece? <laughs> um yeah, my uh, my brother-in-law is a sea captain on a pleasure boat, and he and his wife, who I guess she's the second mate, or I'm not sure what her, she, she cooks, she does everything else, <laughs> and um, so they have traveled around the world. That's what they do. They are on the water, on the boat, almost the entire year, and uh, I was speaking with him at some point and he said, oh, I have all these maps and I don't know what to do with them. I mean, I just throw them out. And I was, I gasped and said, oh no, you have, you know, I want them. <laughs> and he sent me this huge, gigantic roll of these maps from all over the world. So I've been using them in my art for a number of years now. And um, so that's that was the source of this to begin with. And, at first, it just had the maps, and it seemed lacking to me. And you know, it seemed lacking. It was just the that sort of subtle blue greens and what cream colors of the map. And um, I've been really attracted to this violet, purplish purple color, and uh, so I. Um, 
you know, I dyed all of my little little bugs and butterflies. I dyed them this color with the, the colored inks and just, you know, cut them out. And I didn't think of it as instinct in the beginning. And then my husband is a great wordsmith. So I asked him what he thought a title should be. And he came, he's the one that came up with instinct. And I thought, that's it. It's perfect. It really is. Uh, so I don't know if you want to say anything about the nostalgia piece of it. Yeah, I was very curious that you said nostalgic because I don't think of it that way. The maps um, are, are contemporary maps of the world. Um, maybe the little compass has a little bit of nostalgia. I don't because, you know, I'm sure that we have many more um, sort of a, a much more digital way of, of determining what direction we're going in but right. uh, and that's that's what makes me give the give it the nostalgia um yeah i can see that i can see that about the about which I think is really valuable that um to you know honor the tools that have gotten us to this digital world right. and really like feel and touch them and there's also something about like even looking that closely at uh, the insect world in a, in a way it feels like something from like Victorian times where, you know, maybe you'd see uh, preserved hmm. moths and uh, butterflies that I don't know, nobody has those now. <laughs> well, I will, I will say this, that I have many shelves full of all of the dried animals and and skulls and um I have a, a bat in a inside of a jar and a, a red kneed spider all the all the collections that my two boys um collected over the years when they when they were when they were young and I still have all of that on my oh. shelves and I love that collection it's great <laughs> well, I can't wait to see how those things inspire you. <laughs> really beautiful work. Thank you, Robin. And now we'll take a look at David Stock. He has three photographs in our project space this time. David, congratulations on your inclusion in Resonance. I'm, Thank you. I'm always pleased to see new work from you. Is this a new series? Well, I, I guess it is a new series. Um, I have several of them and I'm still working in this way, looking for images like this. I don't usually think of it as a series because it's built on the work I was doing before and this process I'm involved in of um, just walking the streets of my neighborhood over and over. So. I feel like it's sort of an extension of, of work I've done before, but it is another layer and it is new in some ways. Yeah, it's, um, well, I wanna say it's more dense packed, but <laughs> you have a lot of work that's dense packed. <laughs> um, but your eye for complex, surprising compositions is just incredible. And these pieces seem to even take it up a notch. So what is most compelling to you about your approach in these works? Well, I think the challenge is taking a huge amount of detail and information and visual elements and trying to, um, it's not like I'm orchestrating them, but have them appear in a print as if they are orchestrated. And um, I think it's it, a lot of it is just a matter of having paid attention, having walked these same streets and being so familiar with the environment and the rhythms of street life. And um, that when I want to assemble everything, all the visual elements and what people are doing on the street. It's sort of like I, I have the basic tools to do that, but it's very challenging to catch a certain moment 
and also kind of pay honor to the environment um, because, you know, I'm very interested in the actual built environment also. That's an important part of these pictures. Yeah, it's fascinating because um, there's no uh, judgment or, uh, you know, there's humor, but there's no like making fun. It's all very um, beautiful and with love. Um, and I'm very impressed with that. Oh, well, I'm very happy to hear you say that. Um, maybe we could look at the picture with the food trucks under the seven train there. Yeah, this, to me, this is as far as I've gotten in kind of um, distilling my feelings about my neighborhood. Uh, it, I feel like it's, it's full of life. It's highly distinctive uh, in, in physically in the way uh, the environment is built. I like the light. I like what people are doing. I like all the small stories and the details. So, you know, this is, it is a reflection uh, of my love for the neighborhood. And I feel like I'm still, you know, moving in a direction from starting with more appreciating the physical environment to starting to uh, kind of include more people and um, a sense of what the street life is. So it's sort of a complex street life, including uh, both what the energy of what people are doing and the sort of distinctive uh, elements of the physical environment. And I, I can't um, imagine how challenging it is get uh, and each you're consistent with it is what is so wonderful about it so that each piece every inch of it is engaging and it, it's some um uh, uh i want to say technique that you developed like it so i'm very impressed with how you've honed this technique to make these things happen uh, I haven't seen it anywhere else. Wow. Well, thank you. I I really want people to look at all the details. The prints, you know, the actual physical prints are decent size and you can get right up with them. And you see, you know, like there's this delivery man off on the right side of this image and he's just getting started on his delivery and he has a sort of worried look on his face because he's got to handle the situation and there's people in the middle there's some kind of family thing happening where people are putting their arms on each other there's a pregnant woman and her partner who are taking this all in there's the people in the food trucks cooking uh, really absorbed in their work and this nice warm light hitting them and of course the seven train up above uh it's all you know it's all rich to me. And um, so it is very challenging trying to get all that into, <laughs> into one image in a way that, that seems uh, real, that, that speaks. So I, there's a lot more failure than success. Um, but I feel like the work I've been doing. Don't have to tell us that. <laughs> we could just be astounded. <laughs> well, thank you. But so I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. No, no, I was just, you know, it's, I've been working my way towards this. Um, but I'd also say that I'm still, I'm still doing the other work. I still photograph storefronts almost every day. I still uh, get up close and make semi-abstract compositions of the, the colors and the textures and the, the cultural iconography of the neighborhood. So it's all happening at the same time. This is like an added layer. Uh, so, and that kind of leads me to my next question. So uh, you can spend so much time with these pieces. Um, and, and then you start to see abstractions within the obviously realistic space. 
And uh, I'm asking, is this intentional? Obviously, everything's intentional about this. And um, it, does that hint about the direction? And it seems like you've already kind of covered that, but um, I'd like to hear what else you have to say about that. Yeah, I mean, it's all additive in a way. Um, it's like most of these scenes, I've walked the same place a hundred times or more and fo maybe photographed it from a different place. I'm very well aware of, you know, everything, the graffiti, the overhead of the seven train um, and the rhythms of, of what people are doing. So, uh, yeah, it's all, um, it's all additive, but I think there's other layers that, that could come. Um, and I think that it may have to do with more engagement with people. I think I've sort of worked my way more from uh, surfaces and textures and abstraction towards uh, saying what I feel about the neighborhood and engaging more with uh, the sort of uh, um, the street life and the people. Well, I'm really looking forward to seeing more of this street life with people. Thank you, David. Thank you. Uh, and now we can take a look at the chat. I see there's a bunch of questions here. Um, let's see. So uh, Joy is asking, James, how long do you spend on a painting? Uh, it can it can vary, but um, I know at one time I I it's usually longer than I think it's going to take. Um, I at one point I gave myself a deadline. I said I I would take um, one month per painting, and um, and you know it always takes a little bit more. And then just and then since you're work one could be working on. Uh, multiple paintings, um, you don't really know. Um, and I do put things aside and then come back to them. Mm -hmm. So um, it's hard to say. Um, they, don't, they don't happen quickly. I, I don't, I know I sometimes hear people say, oh yeah, I, I dashed that off and it, it was finished. Um, yeah, it generally doesn't work that way for me. Maybe drawings, drawings happen quicker for me than, um, but not paintings. Thanks, James. And, and then Catherine Oreck says, uh, I like that and can identify with what you said. And I believe this was James talking about the fine line between succeeding and failing. <laughs> I don't know if that's a question or just a comment. Do you want to elaborate, Catherine? Sure. It's um, it's something that um, I, I feel in the studio all the time. And um, I, I just heard a a talk recently um, referring to the painter Matthew Wong um, about he not being afraid to make a bad painting. And um, so I, I think that that kind of is the, the, the crux of that, that, um, you know, being there with the work and, and giving yourself over to it. And then, but it's also very hard to do. So um, I, I ad admire the, the work that you have produced, James. It's really a beautiful show. Mm -hmm. And the, um, the, the large painting um, um, is, um, uh, it, it's full of so much stuff. It, it's, um, mm -hmm. there's, it's so beautiful. And yet there's this kind of um, something that I, felt from it is is this um like this uh kind of anxiety of uh what's going to happen in the future these people are moving and they do seem like they are in that space but maybe they are coming from someplace else or moving in and out of the space there's a very strange kind of time thing happening there 
Um, I, I don't know if you, uh, have, if that, if I'm um, making sense or if that uh, resonates with you at all. Um, yeah, somebody else referred to my paintings as ominous. <laughs> um, well, and, it was more, and it, it felt um, like there was like just this edge of anxiety. There's maybe, yeah. maybe the lines coming, you know, sort of, it's almost like, you know, your, your reception breaking up on your TV set or, yeah. you know, something that just, you're. It, it's like something around the corner. You're not sure what's going to happen. You know, I, I just, it seems like a very emotionally complex picture. Uh-huh. Oh, also, I'll tell you, there's a... Um... A, 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 maybe a, a secret of a painting, or, or, or maybe it's also um, uh, something that's wrong. Um, you know, it, the, the title of the painting is 14th Street and 7th Avenue. Um, so recently I was looking at that painting and I see that on the subway part, you know, there's the subway stairs, it says 23rd Street. <laughs> and um, and I, I thought, oh, maybe so. Maybe that's the anxiety. <laughs> I'm in the wrong spot. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, that I think your uh, comment really resonated. Ellen says uh, that she loved the comment about the fine line between failure and success in painting. Beautifully phrased. Yes. And I also just want to say that that the large painting, especially looking at it on the screen, uh, there's just a mystery about it. And that mystery is um, because it's it's real, but not real. It's not. And when you talked about how you constructed it, that made perfect sense to me. So there's something vaguely unreal about it. And that can create a little bit of anxiety. I don't know. Did that, it, Catherine? Does that resonate with what you were feeling? And uh, and I think actually the fact that it says Twenty Third Street, probably, yeah. yeah, that that adds to it. But um, yeah, yeah, no, I I think it's a really really interesting painting. And then just the just having the little because um, it feels a little unmoored in time, mm -hmm. except. Then you've got the signs up there, Seventh Avenue. So you're not completely on. It, it, it's just it's just really interesting um, all the elements of it, and I think um, you know um, just interesting, really evocative. And I know that I know that intersection very well, and the, it's it's a very grubby intersection. <laughs> And none of that grubbiness comes across. That's the other thing that makes it feel so surreal in a way. It's just the light and the way people are moving, you know. It's as though somehow we're in California. <laughs> but um, anyway, it's, it's a brilliant painting. Congratulations. Thank you. And uh, Sarah Haviland is um, agreeing. She says, agreed true appraisal of the process of working through uncertainty to see what can happen. I don't know if Sarah Havlin's still here. Further comment? Uh, Diana Birchall says, I love that this opportunity for us so far away from Cal in California to see your paintings and hear about how you approach and create the work. Very enlightening, meaningful, and beautiful so interesting about the complexity of your colors from the pigeon's backs to the deceptively simple background itself. The work is ravishing, makes you think, and I love that you will be working with figures in the future. Love and admiration from Danny and Paul in California. Oh. <laughs> Very nice, thank you. Uh, and Dee Kirshner says, where's David's neighborhood? Oh, we're now we're on to, and Joy answered in Jackson Heights, Queens. Um, Catherine has to say to David, the work may be more complex and full of detail, but the formal aspects really hold the action together. Mm -hmm. that's, the, uh, that's what's so interesting. And also um, resonating with James's work as well, because you know, you're drawn in by this kind of story, but then the formal aspects of the painting are doing something different that, that gives you that 
you know, more edgy feeling. That it's uh, it's fascinating. Uh, Catherine, did you want to say anything to David? I don't want to. Uh, well, just that I I um uh I think that's it's it's hard to do when you've got lots and lots of detail that um you know then you take you you know find the 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 things that will. And they're not always obvious at I think at first uh, glance, but you know they'll be whether it's a shape or a color or or something that just you know makes it um, cohere. I think it's it's because it you know they could go flying off in all all directions, but so I think mm -hmm. that's a wonderful quality to those prints. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, Adrian Moomin says, what size are the prints, David? Oh, uh, the sheets are uh, 17 by 25 inches. So the images are actually um, 15 by 22 and a half. And uh, are they available in different sizes, David? Yes, they are. They can, you know, as small as six by nine inches framed or unframed yeah um do you have smaller pieces in the drawer so if you come into the gallery you can take a look and just see how it translates to the different size definitely there's some uh smaller frame prints of different images actually but they can help you visualize what the bigger prints would look like in a different size and framed Thanks, David. Uh, so now Ellen Chu says, David, do you capture one moment or several in a location? People are always on the move. So catching a woman in pink leggings who is only there for a second is astounding. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. Um, I do usually um, take more than one frame. Um, but usually not more than a couple. I mean, I it's like a moment happening that I feel like I'm prepared for and that is like um it has to happen fast I mean I'm like uh I some photographers will hang out at a location and wait for the activity to for something interesting to happen and I should probably do that more but I feel like I'm no. I'm losing the spontaneity of it, it, that I'm reacting to the whole thing that's there, including what the people are doing. Yeah. So I think for pretty much all of the ones I've done, I might try like two or three, and then I'll feel like, yes, I, I got it, or it's impossible. Right. <laughs> I'm yeah, happy but, here. <laughs> the formal aspects, as um, uh, Catherine said, are quite extraordinary. I mean, when you have the you have the train going overhead, you know, you've got the gray wall and then the gray train, and then and and that exists, and then there's all this other stuff going on underneath. And um, yeah, so I mean, it made sense to me that you might have taken more than one frame of that. But again, you know, it either happens, as you said, in two or three frames or you just move on. Yeah, it's I mean, I think it's also an astounding eye that um, not that a lot of photographers have that um, I don't have. So I'm really very I have a great deal of admiration for somebody who can catch something so spontaneously. But that woman was on the move. Like if you didn't <laughs> get her and you didn't have those pink legs, the whole thing would not have come together. Yeah. <laughs> and, and David, is this handheld or are you on a tripod? It's handheld. Yeah. Wow. I'm moving pretty fast through uh -huh. the sidewalk and through the crowds. And I I work really, really fast. Uh -huh. I mean, I ha it has to, I see it and I have to either get it or not get it, usually pretty quickly. It looks like you have directed everyone there and said, <laughs> okay, all right, now you, you know, okay, we're about to take the shot. Okay, everybody in pose. <laughs> um, it's, it's astounding. The right there. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, I always said about David and also uh, a photographer we had uh, in the gallery years ago, Laura Weschler, 
um, that, you know, those photographs, like Cindy Sherman would have taken a week to set that up. And you got it, like street photographers just get it in a minute and move on. So that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you both. I see Joanne wants to say something. Uh, you're muted though, Joanne. Thanks, Karen. Um, first of all, congratulations to all four of you. Um, two incredible shows. Um, but I have to say, um, the detail in in all of the work in the two shows is incredible to me. But David, I just um, there's something about your work that goes beyond photography to me. Um, um, first of all, the detail. Um, your eye is just at the site. I'm sure you're you're really tuned in. But then when you go back and you're manipulating them, um, the, the amount of detail, um, when I see your work, it makes me want to go out and start looking more closely at everything. I mean, the detail in the train track and the fence and this and that, it's just, it astounds me how much information there is in each of these pieces. And as beautiful as they look online, in person, I mean, mm -hmm. as a painter, I just, I'm in awe of the way you use color and the sharpness and the details. Um, it, it's just, every time I see your work, I just want to see more. So mm -hmm. congratulations. Um, I think that's great. But I think the thing that, um, first of all, James, I'm going to miss those pigeons so much. <laughs> I cannot tell you how many times since I saw that painting that I have paid attention to every pigeon, every flock of pigeons. And I just think, oh, if only James was here, he would capture this. So <laughs> I'm gonna miss them dearly. Um, I think your show is incredible. But I think the, the thing that the four of you have in common in these two exhibitions is the amount of information, no matter how small the piece is or what the subject matter is. Um, Joy, um, I'm so glad you mentioned the thing about the, the, the bird. Um, to me, when I saw that painting, I was even more drawn to it, not, not just your color and your technique, which is so out of my range, but, um, but that bird sitting on that ledge just made me feel so warm and, and oh gosh, and I knew right away where that was, where you got that um, uh, idea from at Brighton Park. Um, but those kinds of details, Rob, I'm talking about dyeing the, the butterflies and bugs purple, um, there's just so much information. Um, so I just, um, I'm in awe and I'm so happy that I get to see your work up close and personal every single time. Um, two amazing shows. I've, I've been by the gallery several times just to take closer looks. Um, so thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Joanne. Uh, so continuing in the chat, Sarah Haviland says, James, I also appreciate the richness of the color layers in your striated strokes. Mm -hmm. um, Sarah, I don't know if you wanna say anything else. Uh, I, I do as well, James. Um, then we have Bail or Fran says, thanks for all the artists talks and virtual tour of two wonderful shows. I feel lucky to have been at the opening. I encourage anyone who lives in the city to see these shows in person, as wonderful as the images and photos are, they obviously can't compete with seeing the real thing. Thank you for reiterating that, so true. And go ahead and unmute if you wanna to add to your comment in any way. Adrian Moomin says, thanks. Juliet Martin says, joy. I really appreciate the layered progression from nature to the man-made the foreground of the nature, the bird, to the combination of the plant growing out of the man-made planter to the entirely constructed skyscrapers in the distance, the last layer. Oh, uh, Sarah says she's not set up to talk now. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Juliet, I don't know if you wanna say anything else, but, but yes, that's... Uh... It was just such a love, it was just so lovely because you're sort of drawn in. There's this very, you know, this bird almost out of place. And then there's a plant actually growing out of, oh, sorry, a, a plant growing out of something constructed. And then far in the distance, you almost don't see it because it's so far away is this man-made skyscraper. And it's such, 
it's a really interesting composition. I, I really only wanted to paint the bird and the sky first, and there was all this stuff in between. And um, so that was the technical challenge for me. You know, how do, how do I show, I love the space the, from, from the foreground to the background. Um, that was really kind of the challenge to do that. What, where, where do I want you to look? What do I want you to see? But that, it was that bird, it was me, you know, David, I, I sort of sat there and watch that bird and then could I catch it in time with my camera? You know, and I do, I do actually do that. I, I will often sit in a space and wait and wait and wait. You know, I've, I've waited up to, you know, 45 minutes to an hour sometimes for the light to change or the cloud to go away or the sun to come out. So I do that with the photographs that I take that I then bring back to translate to paintings if I'm lucky. Joy, there's also, um, am I muted? Uh, no, no. Now you're muted. Okay, I'm so technical. Um, but Joy, I mean, you're, the way that you paint foliage, trees, I mean, the green, nobody does green like you do green. <laughs> and I think you should talk about your green because it, it astounds me. Um, but yeah, I would have missed that if, if it wasn't in that painting. Yeah, and sometimes sometimes I get sick of, it, of all the greens. Um, I took a class, I haven't taken a ton of classes in watercolor, but I took one years ago where um, the instructor was very vehement about not using green from a tube, that you mix greens with yellows and blues. And that is what I've always done. So I, I do have, the. if you looked at my palettes, you know, I, I have a lot of, hand mixed variations. And even within those, I'm always, you know, mixing those colors. And a lot of it is the color of the light that determines what gets mm -hmm. used, you know? Oh, There's a skyscraper in the back that really just determines what the greens look like in the foreground. Um, it's part of what I kind of observe and study and try and get across in the watercolor. Beautiful. And, and do so, by the way. <laughs> I just want to read this in the chat. Um, Sarah also says, I've enjoyed the artworks and presentations. Congratulations. And Diane Burchall says, uh, please know that for those who are far away, this virtual visit to New York artists and their work is nothing short of wondrous. Thank you. Uh, and now, uh, if anyone wants to unmute and make a comment or ask a question, it could take a couple more minutes. Feel free. Well, I, I just want to say that I really enjoyed looking, Robin, at your work. So even though I've seen it in the gallery, looking particularly at the compass piece, like just on the screen, uh, so there were no distractions, uh, and uh, and and I loved uh, your conversation about it. So, and uh, similarly, Joy, um, you know, I love hearing about your the way you connect things uh, within your paintings. So I just wanted to make sure that I covered all the artists, so <laughs> I know that I like all their work. Thank you. Yeah. So really great well um i recently was gallery sitting so i got to hang out with the work and uh it was great a great experience i james you know your work fills the gallery with like reverberating color and these bold shapes and uh, it's very evocative of the city which of course is something you know we've talked about that we have in common um it's full of that walking on the side streets feeling and um i love the work in the project space that the other folks have done i'm totally in awe of the level the chops that my gallery mates have you know like what what robin and joy did is so hard it's so it, it's a product of so much 
uh, past labor and um, and effort. And uh, so I, I really, you know, I honor that. I think it's really tremendous. Now, I, I want to say that the I've been I've gallery sat twice during the show and people just tumble in from the street. You know, they just look in the window and they tumble in and they're so drawn to um, the work uh, in the solo of James's show. And then, of course, they continue. And then, yeah, it's it's really been uh, exciting. I mean, some people come deliberately because they know that it's there and others are coming by for the first time or a group of people. I don't know where they were from somehow. I thought they were like a class coming in. <laughs> and I asked people, you know, I mean, if they know you, you know, and they're like, no, no, we've never been here before. We just were so drawn. Mm -hmm. So it was really, it's, it's been great. And this, especially this um, past very gloomy gray week, um, gray and rainy week. Mm -hmm. I think um, the two shows are really uh, a love letter about the city. I mean, um, there's so many things we can complain about, about, you know, being in New York these days, but I have to say, it really makes me want to look closer. And so um, I think um, New York, New York, <laughs> you know. James, I wanted to say, I feel like with the the lines and the color and the moment i feel like i'm looking at a moment in between moments mm -hmm. you know as if someone's changing the channel and you're caught right in between the two shows you're watching like there's mm -hmm. something very much like this is happening and this is happening and i happen to catch this little thing in between so i i i feel that sort of tension within the piece that's my life. <laughs> <laughs> right there you with you. Right. <laughs> um, oh, thank you. I recently uh, read a comment by one of our uh, Brooklyn-based artists, Joanne McFarland. Mm. And she was writing about, you know, she produces very beautiful pieces, beauty. And, and she said, you know, it's an antidote to everything that's going on right now in our world. Mm. You know, it, it's her reaction to violence and, and anything else, you know, to produce something that's exquisitely made and beautiful. And I really think that, you know, my colleagues are examples of, of, of that. I think that's what drives us a lot of times, you know, to, to do something very, very beautiful. Mm. It's so gray and rainy outside. You, you look the other way. And I, I find that very satisfying. Mm. And, and Joanne said it really well. So there's actually one more comment from Fran Baylor. She says, thanks again for this glimpse into your art practices. I have to go, but I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Fran. <laughs> and, um, and I just wanted to reiterate that, um, you know, it's great seeing it, you know, online, but if you happen to be anywhere nearby, it's there's two great shows to see in person. I mean, they really, um, they will make you feel great by seeing them, both of them. Um, really beautiful work, very inspiring work. Absolutely. So before we wrap it up, I wanted to make sure that I mentioned that Joy Mackin has a show at Salma Gundy, Black and White. Um, I think she's gonna put the info in the chat if you want to grab it, but the, it's, opening tomorrow and the reception is on Thursday from 6 to 8 p.m. And I also want to mention our next show here at 440 and that is Lee Blanchard has the solo show Heartland and that opens on the 22nd of February and the reception is on Saturday, February 24th from 4 to 6 p.m. And um, in the project space, we have Ellen Chuse, Gail Flannery, and Catherine Oreck with Color Connections. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking forward to our discussion next month. So thank you all for being here and uh, look forward to our next talk. Have a wonderful rest of your Sunday.
Thank you, Karen. Karen. Thank you to everybody who put Thanks. this together. Thank you. And thank you for those of you who tuned in from far away. Yes. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Good night, all. Good night. Good night. Thank Good you night. so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.